Todd from the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney. Um, and he'll be talking about, do we have a slide? Oh, I've already, I've already just over. Oh, okay. And he'll be talking about his work with um, open malaria and open source pharma. So please welcome Professor Matthew Todd to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much for the um, invitation and the chance to come and speak to a very different audience to one that I normally speak to. So normally what I now have to do is to sell open source to a rather hostile room. And I don't think I have to do that, right? Um, but it is a very different audience. So if I make any horrendous uh, gaffes of etiquette or, or, or linguistics, then, then please be gentle. I don't code. Sorry to have to admit that. I don't code. Um, so please be gentle if I, if I make these mistakes. Pretty sure none of you chemistry, actually, but there's more of you. There's more of you, so it's, uh, yeah. All right, so um, the, hopefully in, in this talk, I'm, I'll try and convey um, what, what was just said. So we are playing catch up with you guys. You, you are the, the pioneers. And, and all I'm trying to do is, is mimic the way of working that's been pioneered in open source and apply it to um, initially lab-based research, so thing, wet lab-based research where it's messy and you've got physical objects, chemicals and so on. Uh, and then more specifically, uh, an area where you would normally expect there to be lots of secrecy, which is drug discovery in the pharmaceutical industry. So that's where we're going. We're going to start with some basic research and then move towards the idea of, of discovering new drugs that are going to help people. Um, whilst abandoning secrecy, essentially, and, and, and being inclusive, which I, I think is the way of working that we mean when we talk about open source. It's very interesting. The terminology, um, I realize, is quite contentious. Um, and uh, there was an article um, in The Guardian a few years ago when we were featured along with a few other malaria initiatives. Um, and the first and by far the most keen contributor to the comments section was Richard Stallman, who came along and said, um, no, you can't, you can't call this open source. It's not open source. And so we had a bit of a back and forth about it. And I, I, there were lots of arguments he had which are perfectly valid. And, and one of them uh, was this idea that uh, because we can't um, kind of losslessly copy molecules, uh, it doesn't apply. Um, and we just disagreed about that because I think you, you, you can losslessly copy the information required and you need a bit of infrastructure, but then to code, you need a laptop, all these things. Um, so we, we had this argument about it, and, um, and we didn't really get very far. So I'd be very interested in any thoughts about whether, instead of um, you know, open source pharma, we should be calling it you know, free drugs. But I worry about that term. Um, <laughs> just something about that just doesn't quite work. Um. <clears throat> All right, so the, the first research project that we did, um, we, we kind of started uh, very, uh, a little bit in, in 2005, um, when I, I first arrived here. Um, from, from the UK, and uh, I had this problem that there's, the, there's a molecule, as shown on the top left, uh, this, this molecule is very good for, for curing uh, bilharzia or schistosomiasis, it's a, a WHO drug, um, a recommended drug, that's given to 100 million people a year um, to, to cure them of this nasty parasite that, that uh, lives inside the blood. If you, if you swim in um, various places like Lake Malawi, within about seven seconds this parasite goes through your skin and starts laying eggs in your internal organs, and, and it's horrific. Uh, you pee out another form of the parasite, and a snail in fresh water takes it up. So it's one of these parasitic diseases with a life cycle uh, in, in fresh water, so it's very difficult to get rid of. So you treat people, and this drug is very good at, at getting rid of that. But it's given as um, a pill, a very big pill, uh, with two forms, and, and they're mirror image forms, these enantiomers that some of you may know about from uh, Chemistry 101. Uh, thalidomide had this problem that it was two enantiomers, and one is harmful and one is not. So in this case, um, the form that's shown has that hydrogen atom coming towards you, and that's great. It works extremely well at killing this parasite. Uh, the, uh, the mirror image is where the H is going away from you, and this is ineffective, so half the pill doesn't do anything, and is responsible for this horrific metallic taste you get when you have this pill. Um, when you take this big, if you get the disease and come to Australia and you take the pill, the thing you remember about this experience is not the joy of being cured of Bill Hart's here. It's the taste of this damn thing, which is horrific for this metallic thing that lingers in your throat. And this has an issue, if you're trying to give it to 100 million people, this taste is important because lots of people don't then take the drug. So the task we had was to, to convert this one-to-one -one mixture, which is inexpensive to make, to one where it's just the active mirror image form. Um, and you can do that if you have infinite resources, but because this molecule needs to be very inexpensive, it's difficult. And so we said to the WHO, we can do that. 
um, uh, to make this thing in this mirror image form while keeping the price down. Um, we said that, but we couldn't, of course. You say you can do things, and then you think, okay, how the hell are we going to do that? And so we decided then the best thing to do here, because it's, it's a problem which has precedent around the world, lots of companies do this. We thought, well, what we need to do here is rather than ask individuals, if you've got an idea, can, you know, what do you, how can we do this? You collaborate with the world, and it's something which everyone in this room is very familiar with. Um, but in, in lab-based science, this was not happening at all, and it's never happened in, in chemistry or in in uh, bioactive molecules, never happened. So with the leadership of someone who actually worked as a software engineer, a Drupal person who worked for Oracle, who started this thing, Ginger Taylor, she uh, was in California. Um, I came along and started this um, community with her um, called the Synaptic Leap, um, which is it's kind of dormant now, but at the time it was, it was useful. And we put this problem up there and we said to the world, okay, have at it. And of course no one does anything because what's the incentive? So we had to get some money for a grant to get this going. And then we began um, a, uh, an online lab notebook, so this thing in the top right there, which was the crucial thing. So the, the thing which made the difference was that you, you reveal every day in real time what you're doing in the lab. And suddenly, everyone realizes that you are not a joker and you're not someone who just wants other people to do the work for you. You're someone who's leading the thing and people then can chip in. And I'm sure everyone, again, is familiar with that idea. If you're active, people will respond in kind. Um, we got a little bit of money from a government grant from the Aussie government and WHO, um, and then we were featured by chemistry blogs. This thing called In the Pipeline is a big uh, chemistry blog that everyone reads, um, and we were um, featured is a nice way of putting it. So we, half of the comments on this thing were, were very positive about, well, we should try to do, th do things in a different way in science, right? It's good to try different things. And half of them, of course, were, were viscerally hostile to the idea that you could sort of open source this uh, process chemistry, it's called large-scale chemistry of, of doing chemical synthesis. However, what happened then was that a lot of people began to contribute, including mostly, so 75% of the contributions, there were, there were more than four, I'm not just saying there were three and then one, 75% of the contributions were from the private sector, which really surprised us. And this company, Syncom, on the bottom, they did a bunch of work in their labs, which we couldn't do in, in Sydney, um, and, and accelerated the research enormously. Um, people we didn't know uh, accelerated the research because, of course, we were being open with what we couldn't do. Um, one of the key things was posting a request for help on LinkedIn, actually. One of the rooms there on LinkedIn had a thousand process chemists. So it was very helpful for the project. And an additional benefit is we found a point for LinkedIn, which was really useful. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it's being recorded, right? Um, so the, the upshot was we solved the problem quite quickly. Um, the, the, the top where it just shows you that you just change the molecule. We, this is a different approach to the one we put in the grant proposal. So in the, in the grant proposal, it was all very clever. In, the, in, the, in reality, when we tried to do that approach in, in real life, all of the contributions were saying, no, don't do that. It's stupid. You should do this way. And so the top line is, is that way. So we changed the, pro the research as it was going because of the real-time input from people. Um, as, uh, unknown to us, um, the WHO, who were sponsoring and funding some of this work, were also at the same time funding a private company to look at the same problem without telling us. That was an interesting day when I found that out, um, because we'd been working in, without the knowledge of them, but they could see everything that we were doing, and they came up with the route on the bottom. So it's, kind of, it's not a perfect experiment, but it's an interesting experiment, because the open source solution was similar to the one that came from the private company. Um, about two people worked on the private one on the bottom, and about 30 people worked on the top one. But it's difficult to do the economic analysis because it's not quite clear how much was spent in each project. But it's an interesting, it was, in the end, it was an interesting kind of sociological experiment that you could compare the two side by side. Now, interestingly, since then, um, this route to this pure form of this drug um, is not, of course, of course, is not patent protected, but that has not precluded its progress gradually to market. So um, it's still being evaluated um, in, in people and in animals to see if it's going to be of benefit. Um, but hopefully it is. There's something called the Pediatric Prosequantal Consortium, which is developing a, a version of the drug for kids. And they are very interested in this approach, and they are using it. And, the, and one of the world's largest generic companies, Cipla, is using this approach to see if they can find a market for it too. I saw a big uh, pile of this drug, beautiful white powder, in their labs. And the guy who was leading the project showed me my own lab book on his iPhone, saying, how do you do this bit? So it certainly is use of use. Um, uh, and so you, you, but you know all about this already. So, so to scientists, this is a bit strange. Opening up what you can't do and having people come in with, with a threat, of course, of scooping and people from the outside being more active than you are and all these things. But to you guys, it's fine because you understand that the, there's enormous power in this approach. 
that if you can let go of the control of it and the ownership of it necessarily, and you open up to the possibility of people outside the team being better than you at solving those problems, then uh, you can make progress. So you know all about these technologies, um, which have been so enormously powerful. Uh, it's quite difficult to put a, um, a cost on the commercial impact of open source, um, in fact. But I, I found one resource at the bottom there in, in the gray, which, which said it's a you know, $5 billion value, estimated the total development cost of Linux Foundation's collaborative projects. So the kind of, the kind of extra value that, that going open source for something brings um, is quite interesting. So anyway, you know all about these, these tools. Um, in science, particularly in the pharma industry, um, a great deal of uh, talk is expended on this idea of open innovation. Um, which is nothing to do with open source at all, and, but, but, and yet it, it's seen as being equivalent in, in my field. In open innovation, uh, what usually happens is a company has a problem, and they put the problem in the public domain. And then if someone provides a solution, they buy it, and they take it in, and then everyone's happy. They're given a fee. That doesn't really change anything about the way you work at all. The point is that, in, as far as I'm concerned, in, in the projects that we're doing, which we call open source, it's not just a problem that's public domain. It's every possible solution, and, and open innovation does not adopt that at all. Um, so all these, these big initiatives, they are valuable in a way, but they are, they are completely distinct from what we're talking about here. So uh, as a result of that, um, the idea then was, well, okay, can we then use that approach to discover molecules, <clears throat> which could be uh, pharmaceuticals, where you would normally expect to protect intellectual property? So in a typical drug discovery program, you have a molecule like the one in the top left, which has been identified from some... A screening uh, campaign, and, and it, it's okay, it's good. Um, in this case, that one on the top left killed the malaria parasite pretty well. Um, but it's not a good enough drug because it's toxic or it's cleared from the bloodstream too fast or it has side effects or whatever. So you do what's known as a hit-to-lead campaign. You, you'd go from a hit to a lead, which is a much, much more promising uh, equivalent, uh, derivative of that, of that initial compound. So we thought, let's do this. And I happened to be talking to some people at the Medicines for Malaria Venture in Geneva who were thinking along similar lines. Can we change the way we do drug discovery. Um, and so the idea, rather than the laborious way of, of doing things where you publish papers and try and get a grant and then you wait for people's feedback months after the publication has come into the public domain, instead you work all at the same time together. The good starting points had been disclosed in the public domain. This landmark paper that's shown there, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, a big pharma company, had screened their entire library against the malaria parasite, identified 13,500 molecules that killed the parasite without any knowledge of how they did it, they just, they just uh, killed the parasite. And so they put those in the public domain, a remarkable paper in 2010, uh, which is still providing starting points for people's drug discovery programs. Um, so we took one of those, and from this Prize of project, we adopted these six laws, which I, I thought were the most important that we found in the, in the first WHO project, um, with the first three being the most important, really, to try and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, and these, these have served us quite well, actually. These will be familiar to all of you, I think, in, in essence. Maybe not framed in this way, but I'm sure uh, the, these will be, um, uh, I guess, familiar and comfortable things to do. Uh, but again, in science, these things do not normally apply. We do not normally do any of these things, really. Um, but it served us quite well um, for open source malaria, which is the project that, that came out of all of this stuff. Okay, um, in biomedical science, openness is seen as being good. You know, we, it opens, open access literature is important, and access to open data is important, and, and many of these organizations will, are promoting that. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust have been particularly aggressive, very admirably aggressive, on saying that, okay, obviously you need to publish open access, that's a given, but also all the data that you need to confirm the paper is true also needs to be there as well in the public domain. Um, so we, we still are, um, I guess, one step apart from this because we, we have the lab notebooks in real time, as I'll show you, but we obviously adhere to all these things that, that big agencies are seeing as being important. So uh, in open source malaria, just, very, just to summarize in one slide, we, we've done sort of four campaigns. We published the first, and now we're on the fourth. So it's been going for a few years now. And you, you look at a series of molecules until you think, okay, we can't do this anymore. The molecule is not going to make it. We're going to cut to something else. Um, when you do that, when you, say, when you throw your hands up and say, look, this molecule is not going to get anywhere, you, you then move to something else, but you don't, you don't hide all the existing data, which normally happens in a drug discovery program. So anybody can resume a parked series, as it's called. Uh, so one, two, and three here have been stalled, uh, and four is active, but anyone else can take up one, two, and three, of course. Um, so, okay, so what actually is open source malaria? Well, the main, the bedrock is, is the idea of an open electronic lab notebook, which is probably familiar to everyone here. 
Um, you do work in a lab. You write down what you did. Um, and I think 85% of my colleagues or something still use a paper book with a pen and, and stick things in. I, I kid you not, right? It's like Leonardo da Vinci, right? <clears throat> um, it's like computers, the, the too hard. Okay, so, but the, the first thing you gotta do is make everything electronic so it can be shared and copied and understood and, and examined and extracted. Um, and then, of course, the lab notebook has to be online uh, with no sign in so you can view everything. And we, we used um, a thing on the left there called Lab Trove, which is an open source electronic lab notebook from the University of Southampton. Um, but uh, the development has been a little bit slow. It's been very useful. Lots of people have used it. And so we've transitioned to something which the University of Sydney bought recently called Lab Archives, which has the option of making everything publicly available. And the university is quite generous about giving out guest licenses. So, but this is the bedrock. Everything you do has to go up immediately, um, every day, um, and in a lot of detail so that it can be read and understood. Second thing is we needed a to-do list, right? Who's gonna do what? And we <laughs> experimented with lots of extremely unfortunate um, ways of doing this that didn't work out at all. And then someone pointed us to an issue list on GitHub. And we thought, well, this is exactly what we need, right? This is, this is what you do. You put up something, you assign somebody, you talk about it, you close it. So we have hijacked uh, the GitHub to do this. We, we, we're putting more and more things on GitHub. We have no idea what we're doing, okay? <laughs> it just sounds good, because no one in science knows what it is. Um, and, and so we're trying to use the wiki function, we're trying to use the syncing function, but really, it's, it's comic how, uh, how slow that is, because we're always worried about, about somehow deleting stuff from a hard disk, and I don't know, it just, it, it just, we're uneasy with it. But the to-do list, the issue list, the issue tracker, is sensational, and, and works really well, so everyone's very happy with that. In a way that no other platform has got people to use it, this one has. So we use that very, uh, very frequently. Um, obviously, the data to do with the molecules themselves is on a Google Sheet. We had lots of discussion about how best to do that, but it turns out a, a Google Sheet is quite good. Um, everyone can use it and, uh, and change the data. So the 400 or 500 or so molecules that have been produced so far are up there, um, along with their strings, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but that's very easy to extract the data and download it and use it for something else. And then, of course, you, know, you need a, a place where people gather. And we have a very, very lightweight landing page uh, which has no stuff we change. It's all imported from other things. And we have things like uh, the Twitter feed is very, is very helpful for, for getting people aware of what's going on. So it's quite a light structure, really, um, to use, but it has all the, all the components. Um, I was reading the, um, this, this uh, book called Post-Capitalism by Paul Mason, which is quite, it's an interesting read. And he had a quote in there from, from someone else who's shown that, that talked about what technological change was. And it, it feels like, to me, in, in this project, in, in science, in open source malaria, it feels like open source is technology. In the way that we normally talk about technology being physical bits of equipment, uh, or changes in the way you do certain assays or, or you know, protocols, open source is a technology. Because it does do this. It's an improvement in the instructions for mixing together raw materials. It's a nice definition, which I think does justify that terminology a little bit. Um, so just one example of something that's been going on which has some of these features in it. Um, the current molecules we're working on, they are very promising. They're at the point where you would normally patent the series. They work in a mouse model of malaria. So you give a mouse a version of malaria and you give the molecule to the mouse and the molecule gets to the parasite, kills it very effectively and cures the mouse. So that, I mean, that, that's nearly at the point of going into humans. So it's very advanced. And of course it's all public domain. However, we still don't know how the molecule's working. Um, which eventually, that's going to matter because you need to know. Um, otherwise, it's just magic dust, isn't it? So um, we think, uh, from work done by some collaborators on the project at the ANU, led by Kieran Kirk, that it interferes with an iron pump in the parasite. So the parasite sits there. It's quite remarkable when you see it. There's a, there's a red blood cell, and there's the parasite inside of it. And the red blood cell is like a, it's like a shell with holes in it. It's extraordinary. The parasite's just sitting inside it, living. Um, and it needs to regulate its environment quite heavily. And it has these iron pumps that regulate things like sodium and, and, uh, as, and acid levels and so on. We think that the molecule inhibits that pump because Kieran's done a bunch of work that suggests that that's the case. Uh, but we don't know because the relevant protein is very big and complicated and it's difficult to isolate it. Um, and it turns out that lots of molecules, you don't need to be a chemist, but these molecules hopefully don't look identical to each other. Um, they are, well, maybe they do, I don't know. But um, they are not the same. So they, they, they're, they're distinct structures. And all of these appear to be doing the same thing, which is counter to what we hear in Biology 101 or Enzymology 101, where we have a lock and key idea and one target has one thing that fits in. Here we've got like 30 now molecules that all fit in and they're all doing different, and they all have different structures and we don't know why that is. So we don't understand at all what the, um, 
of what, how this thing is working. People have um, given the bugs low levels of drugs and, and generated resistance in the lab, um, and then sequenced the genome and worked out what's changed, which is quite, becoming an increasingly common thing to do. And, and you, you have this uh, in silica image of what we think the target looks like on the left, a homology model. We think it looks a bit like that. And you, you plot the bits in the colored circles where the, resist, where the mutations happen, and they're, they're all over the place. So we don't really understand this target at all, but it's certainly a crucial target and very interesting. Um, so we decided to try and run a competition where we said, okay, well, here's the database of everything. Here's all the molecules that hit this thing. Here's a bunch of molecules that don't. Have at it and see what you can come up with, computational model. Um, and it was an interesting experience because over the course of a few months, um, several people were interested in the project. Eventually, six full models were, were submitted, and we, we ran the models against a, a secret data set that we held back from the, from the competition to see how well they did. And um, there were some winners, 500 bucks, and uh, some good karma, you know, we, we handed out. And uh, they, they don't work too well, actually. So there, was a, there were winners. <laughs> there were winners, absolutely. And if, if anyone was watching who did this competition, it, it was really great. But they, they are not predictive. So we still can't use the models to say, well, this molecule is going to work, and this one won't. They're just, a little, they're just better than, than a random set, obviously. Uh, so what we need to do is release more data, then work with people. And every single submitter of the solutions, um, none, of them, none of whom we knew, um, all of them want to use more data to refine the models with each other. And it's that kind of constructive willingness to work with strangers, which is just so awesome when, when it happens, um, that we think we will eventually move towards a predictor model for this with the help of these people who have high levels of expertise that we do not. Um, from volunteers and people who follow online to the big guys. Um, so this guy, Scott Obach, is an expert in a particular area of drug discovery in Pfizer in the US. And uh, he's been working with us quite a lot on the project and is giving time and expertise um, to, to really amazing levels. Um, the most recent of which, he, he took the molecule in the top right, which was one of the ones we've been working on that's very promising, has a, a, a green figure of 0.13, which is a, a high level of potency against the parasite. And um, he uh, put this thing through a kind of uh, smush of liver cells, which does oxidative reactions. So in your body, your liver is constantly getting rid of molecules by, by uh, changing the chemical structures of these things in your blood that maybe you don't want. And he did that with this molecule and fished out on the bottom right molecule there, where there's an extra OH, an extra hydroxyl group. And this molecule is super potent. It's, it's extraordinarily potent. And it's a new part of the molecule we hadn't changed before. And he, he did this work in his lab with his uh, technicians and so on and uh, shared the results with us freely in the public domain. So there are really, big pharma can't do open source. Right? They just, it's completely against the business model. But the scientists want to. And the scientists want to help out. And the scientists really do. And the companies, I think, are OK with things so long as there is some you know, PR return or publication return. But we have uh, seen really enormous contributions from the pharmaceutical industry throughout. Interestingly, that molecule that he found, we were so excited about it, we thought, great, we need to make some of this in the lab and check it's true. So we made it in the lab, and it's not active at all. So now we're in the public domain, and we have an issue, right? So we've got a, something which we think is really good, and, and the same structure, we've got something which isn't good at all. And we are now, today, now working this out. So if you go to the Open Source Malaria uh, GitHub issue post for Series 4, this is the main subject of conversation. What are we going to do? Because something's not right here. Either the biology, the one that came from Pfizer wasn't right, or the one that we've made in the lab wasn't right, or there's something else going on. So unusually, in this project, of course, if you have snafus, you have to deal with them publicly. You can't then go behind closed doors and pretend it didn't happen. So it's an extra feature you have to deal with. And you have to therefore be sensitive to people's reputations and contributions. So the approach, obviously, is quite set up for uh, crowdsourcing in, uh, in student labs. Everyone can see what everyone else is doing. And this has happened repeatedly in open source malaria. It's interesting because students, junior students can make molecules for real research projects and have them evaluated. This happened first with uh, Lawrence University, uh, just north of Chicago. And the students in the, in the undergrad labs made molecules which actually work. They're nanomolar potent against malaria. And they got very excited about it. It was a great, great thing to do. It brings up lots of teaching questions for us. If every student can see what every, every other student is doing, what do you do about plagiarism? How do you assess contributions? It's quite a challenge to mark. Um, you may also have heard about open source malaria in this story that was from last year. Um, there's a drug called Daraprim, and Martin Shkreli from Turing Pharmaceuticals raised the price 5,000% overnight. It became a very expensive uh, drug for toxoplasmosis. Uh, Daraprim was also an antimalarial originally. Um, and we worked with some students at Sydney Grammar School um, to uh, see if we could make this molecule in the lab to illustrate to people who maybe don't realize 
that the price of the medicine has nothing to do with how difficult it is to make. It's to do with how much someone can charge for it. Um, and so these students worked with their, their teacher before and after school and made a, a gram of this drug or so um, in that time, revealing that it's very easy to make. And one of the students there is holding up the vial with a street value of $150,000, right? He's holding that. So it's trying to reveal the absurdity of these rules that allow these grotesque issues to do with drug pricing. Um, and the, they were featured on the, the Daily Show over on the right there um, the, for, for their achievement in doing that. Um, the chemistry they had to modify and change, and they did that using the platform that we have. And they were able to get inputs to the science from me and from Alice Williamson, who, who was at Sydney and who drove this, and from um, other people around the world. So it helped that they were doing this openly. Um, very, very exciting moment when they, um, they submitted a sample to us at Sydney Uni, and we did the advanced analysis on a piece of equipment that the school doesn't have, and Alice posted the result up there um, on, the, on the thing. It was late at night, and I remember seeing it and thinking, wow, that's amazing. They've, they've totally nailed us. Not only have they nailed this molecule, it's primo grade, Daraprim, absolutely amazing. <laughs> I couldn't see a fault with it, and, and I, 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 yeah, I, was, I was in awe of the, the purity of the molecule they made. Um, <clears throat> All right, so one more uh, example input, again, just to hammer home this point. Uh, a, a guy that we, we don't know who works in the U.S. in a company uh, was interested in, in um, the third series on open-source malaria, shown in the top right, this beautiful molecule, um, kills the parasite very effectively. We don't know what it's doing. Uh, we can't change it without the potency disappearing. Um, and we're trying to work out uh, by comparing the molecule and the, all the inactive versions with everything that's known, we're trying to work out what the molecule might be doing. Um, and uh, he's been doing a bunch of work here, which has led to new plans for experimental assays to try and validate his predictions. So he's predicting it hits certain targets, and we can find people who have those proteins in the labs, and we can run those assays. Um, but he's done a lot of work spontaneously without being asked for all these reasons here, um, that he, know, he knows it's needed, and he knows it'll be valued. Um, all these reasons that I think everyone here should be familiar with. Um, but it, it still surprises scientists that this happens, that unsolicited high-quality contributions can emerge from anywhere. Um, and yet, here, here it is. Okay, so just as a, as a summary of what it is, this open source malaria, it's the platform as well, but it's also this, this, the community, an idea of how to do research differently. Um, and on the bottom left, we're always very conscious that we want the information to be machine-readable. Um, so people don't really understand that point, but it's not, we, we publish things in lab notebooks in order that everyone can see all the data and justify everything, and there's no, there's no confusion. It's fully transparent. But of course, you also want the lab notebook to be read by a machine. No human is going to read a lab notebook. If you ever tried, it's not fun, OK? It's a lot of very boring information. But what you want is something that can be digested by a machine. An extra value can be extracted from that. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so a lot of people in science ask, well, if you, everything's public domain, how do you publish it? But that's, that was a problem five years ago. I think there are still some publishers that are holding out. But certainly nowadays, um, lots of good publishers, PLOS and Nature and Science and all these places, and now ACS, Central Science, the American Chemical Society, which is the world's biggest scientific society, has a journal which was very keen to publish this stuff, and they were happy with the idea that it was already all public domain. So I think things have changed a lot, um, and certainly it's possible to publish open source science. One of the nice things about, about this for me is the, the trust that the transparency engenders. And of course, again, it's a familiar point. But you know, whenever you go into a highfalutin restaurant and you can have an open kitchen, you, your faith is restored in the cooking process. right? You can see what's going on. Um, and, and, you, and you assume it's not a front and the real kitchen's out the back. But you're, you're looking at the, real, at the real kitchen. And it's similar. My, my wife works in, uh, is, plays in an in a orchestra, the Balmain Symphonia, which is an amateur orchestra in Sydney. And um, she, whenever I go and, and watch her, I'm always I always have to sort of take my eyes off the orchestra and, and look at the ground so I can listen to the music. But most people spend the whole time staring at the orchestra when they're in, a, in an orchestral production. There's a fascination with seeing how something's achieved, I think. You, you, you love to have the, the sense of, I understand how things are put together. It makes more sense now. Um, and, I, and I think you get that a lot. My first thought about that was, was um, when I was a, a, a postdoc in California. Um, it was when the internet was growing, really. It's like 19, 1999. And Google was becoming a big thing. And I remember back then seeing things um, uh, where you, you could play a video game and you, you could press a button and be in the eye sockets of the player. So you, you, you could wander around a 3D environment and see how other people played it. Man, you learn quickly when you do that. When you watch someone else do something through their eyes, it's amazing how quick that is uh, to convey information and technique. Um, I think teachers gasp for that kind of 
immediacy and effectiveness of, of uh, communication. <clears throat> So um, in the big picture for open source malaria, there are a bunch of things we've got to do. Um, the, the impact of the project, if we can get series four, these molecules, into clinical trials where you start giving them to people, uh, that would be the first time uh, a public domain molecule where everything is known and nothing is um, owned, that would be the first time that has ever happened, that a molecule has ever gone into clinical trials. Of course, if it goes through clinical trials and gets to market, it would be the first time we've ever had a molecule that is um, discovered in this way getting to patients. So the, the, the stakes are high, and people are watching what's happening. We're almost at the point of going into clinical, but we need to solve a couple of problems first. Um, there are other things that are mentioned there, lots of things to do with the platform I'll mention in a minute. Um, and then on, on the bigger side of things, of course, you know, funding is a big thing. Um, and, and if we do do these things about taking a molecule into trials, we're going to need people to help with the, the legal and economic side of those things, where we don't really have the expertise at the moment. Um, so in terms of just the, the how you convey what a molecule is, um, this is a big feature of how limited we are at the moment. You notice if you go to the Google homepage, you type stuff in. You can't draw anything there yet. I'm sure that will come. But you can't draw a molecule. Now, a human will look at that molecule in the top and immediately see what it is. A computer has no idea what that is. So they have to convert that thing with some software, which can be freely available, into so-called strings. Um, so there are three kinds of cheminformatic strings that represent the molecule, an inchy, an inchy key, um, and a, a smiles, which is on the bottom. So there are different formats, three different formats usually. Um, and so to do that, to make the lab notebook understandable by machine, you have to get that information in there. And it's a hassle to do it, automatic, uh, to do it manually. Right? You have to remember to convert every single structure into that. And when you're discussing a molecule, you have to remember to paste those strings in. It's a nightmare. Uh, it just doesn't work. The computer doesn't understand what the, what the molecules are that you're talking about. Um, if we could understand the molecules, then you would have lab notebooks which could understand the chemistry you're doing. And they say, oh yeah, you're doing this molecule. What I'm going to do, I'm going to search the web and find the person in the world who's working on that molecule as well. Or well, working on the molecule that's the most similar. So we propose this thing called uh, Cinder, um, as a homage to Tinder, uh, to introduce people to each other. It's the, uh, thanks. It's a science introduction robot. Um, the idea is that it would, it would automatically identify possible collaborations. But before that to happen, we need a lab notebook that understands the molecules. And there are, there are a few attempts of this in the, in the open domain. One is this uh, thing by Luke Patini called C6H6, the bottom line there, and it was just recently uh, published. And it's an open source electronic lab notebook. It needs improvements and modifications because you can't search on the structures or whatever. But it's a great starting point that is beginning the process of having a lab notebook where the lab notebook understands what the molecules are. Um, Mike Robbins is in the audience, uh, who worked on open source malaria as a volunteer uh, a few years ago, had the first really good go at this. And he, uh, he, he found that what you could take is the source image column there is how a human looks at molecules. And we had a bunch of these things written on the lab notebooks. He found that there was a bit of software called Osra, which is an optical recognition system for molecules. Um, and it, when you apply that thing to the molecules, it comes up with a gen image column. And, and if the human looks at that and says, yeah, good, that's the same, you then tick a little box, and it would paste the smiles into the lab notebook. So it's a very neat thing that we never implemented because uh, we didn't put it into the lab notebook that we were aiming to put it into. But a, a neat idea, and what we need to do, of course, is, is have this as an automated process where the lab notebook's churning away in the background, understanding what you're doing. Um, so we, we're kind of setting the stage for this idea that you have a scientist doing research in the lab with a laptop next to them and the laptop is an active participant in what they're doing. So in, in human, what's it called, advanced chess, this is advanced chess, where humans sit with laptops and play another human sitting there with a laptop. It's, it's, a, it's a great combination of expertise. You've got the intuitive thoughts of the human coupled with the number crunching of the laptop. We don't do that in science. We do science in the lab, and then we go away and do a little bit of searching, and then we come back in the lab. We don't work seamlessly with, um, with any kind of AI help, and that's got to change. Um, specifically, very interesting. I was thinking about this. GitHub is, is very clever in the way that you can um, tag other issues. And in those other issues, have, have links installed back to what you're talking about. Very, very useful way of creating a network of conversations. Extremely useful for us to do that. What we want here is, is for that platform also to understand molecules. So we have a, we have a spreadsheet of molecules in, in Google Sheets. Uh, each of them has all the strings needed, and they have a number associated with them. And what we want to do is to be able to talk about a molecule, uh, blah, blah, I made this molecule, blah, blah, blah. And then when you refer to the molecule, to put in a little, little symbol or something, which tells GitHub to go and call the information from the spreadsheet. 
I don't think that exists yet, but that would be tremendously useful to help with this kind of colloquial discussion of science that you need in, in a science project to make sure that the computer's going to understand what it is we're talking about. Um, other things that we need, which are, which are um, easy and obvious, we, we don't know what we're doing with the web page. It doesn't update very, very uh, effectively. It's not an attractive thing to look at. Um, we don't automatically port our data from the Google Sheet into big databases like PubCamp. Um, newsletters, we, I hope we just solved. We're about to send out our first one. It was interesting to hear yesterday about the importance of newsletters um, in, in the, the beginning of yesterday, because I think it really does make a difference. Um, don't know if we should become a nonprofit. Probably. I have no idea how to do that. Um, so that we're just li weasels limited in this way. And a as a result of yesterday, seeing some stuff on the Twitter feed, I realized suddenly, man, we've got to have stickers. I, I, I see it. I get it. I've got no stickers on the computer. And so I, I thought, you know, actually, a while back, we, we put a, the logo on Redbubble. I know we can get t-shirts. So I went there last night and said, oh, great, we must get some stickers. There they are. They're there already. They're $3.28. dollars 28 Get a bunch of stickers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start buying stickers and giving them to everybody. That's something else I learned from this conference. Um, and, uh, and I guess one big thing, just to finish with the open source malaria stuff, the one big thing that's missing is uh, automatic construction of narrative. So um, one of the biggest headaches <clears throat> is when you have me and others and our, the volunteers around the world and the students who are participating doing work, the most important thing is to try and fold that work into a wiki, which, update, which, which is the project. right? So people coming can have an immediate uh, understanding of where you're up to. And we just, we just don't do it. I don't know why. We're so busy doing the work, we don't then uh, have the time to, to fold it into a story. So we try, but it just doesn't work because people don't take the time, um, which is unfortunate. So we end up doing the usual thing, which is at the end you scramble to get a paper together. But what you want is a, is a wiki which you then click publish. Um, and we don't do that. Rapid Science is an organization which is, I think is also interested in this problem. And I was at a conference recently where I, I saw this paper and a guy, Larry Hunter, who was involved, give a talk about it, where you can train uh, a little AI on millions of biology papers and get it to start to understand the language that's used to develop these gene ontology terms, which allows it to read a new paper and understand roughly what it is you're talking about, what the science is, and then, and then to use that and explain in natural language what the paper is about. Again, these biologists, they're just way ahead of us. If we could do that with chemistry, so if we could have something which monitored what was going on and could construct English sentences which described the impact of what was going on, tremendously powerful. But that's a big ask. It's a big ask. The automatic creation of narrative would be an amazingly useful tool for lots of research scientists, I think. Um, all right. <clears throat> so. Uh, we are next week going to launch the second open source drug discovery project um, with the Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative um, in Geneva. This is a, a disease called mycetoma, technically eumycetoma, it's a fungal infection. When you get a tattoo done, the ink goes into a place where it doesn't grow out, a subcutaneous layer. There's a fungus, this mycetoma thing, which can get there too and, and grows and just grows and grows and there's no treatment for this disease at all. So if you get it in Sudan, it's one of the big places. You can be walking along barefoot and step on a thorn, and that's enough to push the fungus into this area of the skin. And then it grows, and there's nothing you can do about it. So the treatment is um, amputation, basically. And there are no drugs for this disease. So DNDI, this organization, are funding the first clinical trial of one molecule, and they need a backup to discover more possible compounds. And we're the backup, so we're going to launch next week with a, a paper that we've been working on a little bit in Sydney Uni and with a collaborator and we're disclosing the first hits and then the project will function open source. Um, the disease is horrendous so I put a sensor thing there in case anyone is uh, squeamish. You should not look now because this is a typical uh, foot that is, it used to be called Madura foot. So if you're squeamish, close your eyes. Okay, open your eyes. So that is, that is one I mean, it, there's, a, there's a welcome trust center for mycetoma research in the Sudan in Khartoum. And much of the work that goes on in there is like a butcher shop. It's just things have to be cut off, and, and, and it's horrific. So it's, it's a very good project, for I think, for an open source project, because there's an immediacy there. There's a need for it. And, and the, the slate is clean. There's nothing for, the, for this disease. So um, it's, it's an exciting thing to do. And I'm hoping that the open source mechanism will solicit a lot of stuff from the community and from pharma. We shall see. 
All right, so speaking of that, <clears throat> I always get asked from a science audience and from a policy audience, I always get asked, well, it sounds, sounds good. Um, openness accelerates research. No one can doubt that. If you want to collaborate, the best way to do that is not to have secrets. That works fine. But in pharma, who's going to pay for all this stuff? H how is that going to work? So we've been looking at this a little bit um, on and off, organizing a few meetings with some people from the private sector and the public sector and WHO and people like that. And um, we summarized a lot of those discussions about how this might work. How can you get a drug to market with no secrecy? Um, in this paper in PLOS Medicine uh, just last year. So the detail argument is there um, about how this would work and what's needed. Um, and it really is not so difficult to imagine um, this working for lots of different reasons. Um, the, um, I thought I had another slide there, sorry. So the, the idea, of course, is to take the same idea that everything's open. And so at any given point, Funding part of the project is done in full knowledge of how well the molecule is performing. Um, there are already large amounts of money from Gates and from, uh, from governments going into drug discovery. And I'll, I'll mention a couple of those in a minute. Um, the problem is not the finance. The problem is a lack of precedent. So we don't have an example of a molecule being discovered in the public domain going to patients. And that's why there's a blockage there. Uh, what we need, of course, is to take another lesson from you guys. The investment of the private sector in open source software development is unbelievable. I, I had no idea. I knew it was important. I didn't know it was so large. Um, so this, this article in Crunchbase from last year had the graph, investment in open source software companies. Um, and, and it's in the first quarter of 2000, 2017, $371 million just from VCs into companies that do open source software development. It's incredible. So we have nothing like this in the pharmaceutical industry, nothing at all. We have these inputs, these valuable inputs from individuals, but we have no large scale input. Um, in law, big companies mandate that their staff have to do pro bono work um, in order for the company to be a member of the law society or whatever. Again, that doesn't happen in open source, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. You need people's time, expertise, in a more official way. So I'm really hoping this is going to change in the next few years. We shall see. Um, a lot of people worry that, that if it's open and you can't patent things, then, then that's not going to work because you need a patent to develop a drug. No, you don't. You don't at all. So penicillin and the polio vaccine are examples of medicines that reach patients without a patent just because of the way that they were done. It was pre the internet era, right? So it wasn't open source or anything. The data behind the molecules wasn't there, but they reached the patient without patent protection. Um, one of the most widely used antimalarials, ASAQ Coasicam, is patent-free, developed by a company and an NGO. Fexanidazole, which is a, comp uh, a drug which is looking really good for sleeping sickness in Africa, um, is also transitioning through to market without a patent. So there are these ways of doing it, and hopefully we can get that precedent we need to show that you don't need to be so protective. The way I think this is going to work, I think this is going to work, is you can get investment from everybody, from a composite of governments and NGOs and, and pharma companies, if you can promise that the people who need to make their money back can make their money back. And there's a way you can do that. There, there are two protections for a drug. Everyone obsesses about patents the whole time. A drug has a patent, and a drug has something called data exclusivity. If you pay for the trials in humans, um, you get a reward from various governments, the US government, the UK government, lots of governments around the world. You get a reward for doing that. For generating the data, which says the molecule is safe, you get a reward, which is that you can sell the drug for any price you want for six years. It's called data exclusivity. And it's very attractive because the clock only starts when the drug hits the market. Whereas with a patent, it depends, right? It can be ages. So it's very, very attractive. This thing, uh, there's no law that says you can't put all that data in the public domain. So there's a chance that you could develop a drug completely open and then be granted some exclusivity enough to, to put the, the price of the molecule at a level which in six years would get whoever wants the money back and get the money back. And then at that point it goes generic, as expected. That could be a way of solving this need for a big investment if there are people there with large resources who need to make a, uh, some kind of return. But we shall see. The one thing, I guess, that, that worries me is, is that we're always talking about the need for new approaches, all the time. Um, these are some examples in the dementia field which is the looming catastrophe for our civilization, is, is that we have dementia looming. We have no drugs for it. There are no, no drugs for Alzheimer's at all at the moment. And it's an extraordinary failure rate, and it's this looming catastrophe. Um, and yet, every, so everyone's saying, oh, we're going to do it differently. We've got to do it differently because the usual approaches aren't working. Great. Let's do it differently, right? We're all going to do it differently now. 
because uh, the, the current approach isn't working. And no one's doing anything differently. No one is doing anything differently. And worse, there are international, there, sorry, there are national um, projects, like the ones mentioned in the UK, and Paul Allen and, and others, who are funding research in a way that they're, they're trying to get things done, but no one's changing the way the research is being done. And no one's working with each other to, to give the data in the public domain and try and create larger consortia. I just think if we genuinely want radical approaches, we need to do the exact thing that the farm industry cannot do, which is, as far as I'm concerned, is open source drug discovery. So thanks for some people. You may know Alice Williamson from her science popularization stuff on FBI radio this morning, for example, and other things. Uh, she was a, a, an, an enormous influence on the direction of um, open source malaria, some of the other postdocs involved, a lot of um, uh, contributors. Uh, and of course, many are anonymous, so they can't be thanked, but lots of people have contributed. And um, funding agencies, mainly the Medicines for Malaria Venture in Geneva, have been enormously supportive of the idea of open source and drug discovery since day one. And thanks so much for listening.